Welcome everybody to our Wednesday Word. You can probably hear the rain falling in the background. Lovely, refreshing uh, rain, which we thank God for. There'll be no Wednesday Word uh, next week. Um, I'm unable to do it next week. However, the Sunday messages will continue as normal and we'll be back with Wednesday Word, God willing, on Wednesday, 25 November. Thank you to all who have contributed to our Thanksgiving at St. Olive's. We thank God for everything that's come in and uh, are very blessed to receive it. And, um, and that will stay open until the end of the year. Now we continue in Mark's Gospel and today we thinking about Jesus and unbelief. Uh, this part of Mark's Gospel is, is an interesting but sobering account of Jesus' ministry amongst the people that he grew up with. We'll read it in a moment. It's in Mark chapter 6, verses 1 to 13. We've already seen earlier in Mark's Gospel how his own blood brothers, his own immediate family, thought uh, that he was out of his mind about the things that he said and the miracles that he was doing. And now the very people that he'd grown up with, uh, whom he had loved and been loved in return as a child by them, how he'd grown up as a man in Nazareth, working as a carpenter, and yet now they reject him. And yet despite the fact that they turn against him, Jesus still seeks to reach out to them. So let's think firstly today about the thwarting of Jesus' ministry by unbelief. And I'm going to read Mark chapter 6 and verses 1 to 6. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. And when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked? What's this wisdom that has been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brothers of James, Joseph, Judas and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And so they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his relatives and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few people who were ill and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Uh, Jesus is careful as he approaches his uh, hometown crowd. He took his disciples with him, which really then identified him as a rabbi with an entourage. And he waited until the Sabbath before he began to minister publicly. So he did the conventional thing so as to cause as little offense as possible. Initially, they're all amazed at his wisdom and miracles. They knew that he wasn't a trained rabbi, and yet he spoke with a clarity and with an authority beyond which they'd ever heard from their normal rabbis. But then, as so often is the case, as they began to talk amongst themselves, the mood changed, and so contempt and unbelief set in. And so they say, or some say, isn't this the carpenter? Isn't he just a common laborer, the village handyman? He's got a Galilean accent, just like we have. And so what they're really saying is, what does a mere carpenter know about prophetic interpretation and explaining the Old Testament scriptures? Why should we listen to him? Jesus was a victim uh, of what is all too often common amongst human relationships, and that is that familiarity breeds contempt. Or as Campbell Morgan put it, he says this jealous, run-dropping attitude towards Jesus by his hometown was simply part of humanity's contempt for itself. What a privilege it had been for them to have lived in the same town as Jesus for 30-odd years, to have seen firsthand his sinless life and character, and then to reject him with contempt. What a tragedy that is. But let's pause for a moment, for we too have privileges. Most of us listening uh, to this YouTube, live within reach of a church where the gospel of Christ is soundly and regularly preached. And it is a great privilege to be a Christian. And yet we must be careful never to grow weary or tired or even become bored or familiar 
of living out our responsibilities of being a Christian. So what is the effect of the hometown rejection of Jesus? We're looking now at verses 4, 5, and 6. And the Bible tells us that Jesus was amazed on different occasions. He was amazed both by faith and by unbelief. So, for example, on one occasion, he was amazed at the great faith of the Roman soldier who urged Jesus just to say the word. And remember what Jesus said to him, I tell you the truth. I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. That's in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 8. But here, on this occasion, Jesus is astounded at their lack of faith. And what is the result of their lack of faith? Well, Matthew, in his Gospel, chapter 13, verse 58, puts it like this. It says, Jesus did not do any miracles there because of a lack of faith. Now, the fact that Jesus didn't do miracles there does not mean that his power was limited by the people's unbelief. It simply means that Jesus will not force people to respond to him. Or as William Henriksen puts it, he could not perform these miracles there because under the circumstances of unbelief and opposition, he did not want to do them. If we put this into our own time, the bottom line is that unbelief robs the church of its power. We can add many new programs until we don't have enough hours in the day to attend all of them. But without a believing expectancy in Christ and in his power, nothing will come of it. Well, the disciples, they were watching this exchange between Jesus and the home, homegrown crowd. And they learned some lessons about ministry and about serving and witnessing witnessing for Jesus. And they saw that the very first priority was that people must believe. They also learned that it would not be easy out there as they took the message uh, to people who needed to hear it. If Christ found it hard to work in a situation of unbelief, how much more would they when the ground is hard? And that leads us on to our second and final point today, and that is the instructions of Jesus about ministering to unbelievers. And so we pick up in Mark chapter 6 and we read now from verse 7 to verse 13. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the twelve to him. He began to send them out two by two and gave authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place. Shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed with oil many people who were ill and healed them. The reason for sending them out two by two is the fact that having two witnesses meant met the legal requirements for authentic testimony and of course it also provided mutual encouragement and prayer for ministry so what's happening here is that jesus is preparing for the time when he's no longer with them and he's preparing to multiply his work and so the disciples are commissioned by jesus to carry on the work that he is being doing now of course they have been prepared from the time of their selection in chapters 1 and 2 of Mark, they've been with Jesus, they've shared his experiences, they've received private instruction, they've been exposed to his power over demon possession, over sickness, even over death. And of course, they've listened to the content of his messages and his preaching. And all this has prepared them for, for what will now become a more direct involvement in his ministry. And so we notice that in the instructions given here by Jesus to these first disciples, they were for a specific time and place. And therefore, we can't conclude that today we must do exactly what they were doing there. However, the principles for ministry to an unbelieving world that we find here are abiding and are helpful and are useful for all time. So what are the principles? Number one, regarding provisions here in verses 8 and 9, uh, he says that we should rely on him, that we, as we are sent in the name of Jesus, so we should rely on Jesus, that we should be dependent upon him for strength in ministry. Today, 
I believe we are in danger of having too much baggage rather than too little. Of course, culture changes and with it acceptable styles of living, but it is always a bad testimony to the world when Christian leaders, Christian preachers, abandon a commitment to a straightforward lifestyle and instead go in pursuit of money. That will obviously be a conflict of interest and the world certainly will take note and will notice. Number two, regarding comfort. Jesus says in verse 10 that they were not to change homes for their own comfort. After all, they're not going on a pleasure tour. True Christianity and ministry is not always easy and it is not always comfortable. Number three, Jesus was specific about how to respond to acceptance uh, and to criticism. And he knows that their ministry must follow the pattern of his own ministry. He was criticized for what he said. We will be criticized from time to time for what we say and for what we believe. And so he says in verse 11, verse 12, that they were to remain with those who accept them, but to warn and reject, the, reject those who by refusing to listen to their message reject them. So does this mean that we adopt a hostile and uh, perhaps even a sort of a aggressive approach to spreading the gospel? And of course the answer to that question is no. Or as William Lane puts it, by leaving those who reject the gospel, uh, they were to move on to, more, to new people who were more ready to receive it and to accept it. So what happened to the twelve as they went out? The result was, as we read, they drove out many demons, they anointed many sick people with oil and healed them, and so the twelve experienced great power in bringing the gospel to an unbelieving world. It was repentance, deliverance, healing, just as if Christ himself was physically there. And what we have then is a pattern for outreach, um, which is the responsibility to take the gospel out, the responsibility of every Christian. Let me just end with a little story to maybe just bring this home. It's about a young boy, about seven years old. He went to Disney, Disneyland with his family. But uh, in the excitement of going on all the rides, he was separated from them. He was having such a wonderful time. It was quite a while before he realized that he was lost. And when he discovered the predicament he was in, he first tried to figure out a way to get back to them. But after a time, it finally dawned on him that he didn't know where he was going or how to get there, that he really was lost. Now, the same is true for unbelievers today. They may, may not know it yet because they are having a wonderful time. But nevertheless, they are lost. Sooner or later, it's going to dawn on them that they don't know where they are going and they don't know how to get there. Two things were necessary for that young boy to be reunited with his family. Firstly, he had to recognize his condition, that he really was lost. Secondly, somebody had to come and show him where he could find his family. And it's like that in evangelism. The Holy Spirit will first convict individuals of their lostness. But we Christians, we are commissioned. It's our responsibility to show them and explain to them the way of salvation. And may God give us such opportunities and give us the right words when those opportunities cross our paths. So let's pray together. And our Heavenly Father, as we close today, we thank you for this pattern of ministry that Jesus has given us. And we do pray, Lord, that you will bring across our paths those who are lost, and especially those who know that they are lost. And that then there is a way open for us, Lord, to show them the path of salvation and to tell them the gospel. Every human being needs to turn and respond to Jesus. We pray that you'll use us in some small way. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.